It's a little earlier in the week but nor- than normal, but we're here for another week of pop politics. We are. Which means we'll have a little bit more time to talk about a couple of things, because yeah. we just did our marathon podcast <laughs> last week. It was like five days ago now. So let's jump right into the pop. Um, I think that Stu has a couple Olympics things for us. Yes. So the Winter Olympics are still going on, because they're like a two-week thing. Um, and then the Paralympics after that. Right. Right. <laughs> Um, so, first off, it's interesting, if anyone's looking at the medal count, the U.S. is, like, oddly lagging behind. Really? Yeah, let me pull up a updated medal count, because usually, um, and I think this kind of talks or speaks to, like, a broader culture of American dominance, like, where we feel like we have to be number one, we're the best, we're the... We're so cool, we're so awesome, right. we're the best country in the world, blah, 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 blah. Like, there's that narrative in American culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we just expect to be awesome. And so when we go to the Olympics, we ex- just expect to win everything because we're so good, right? Yeah. Um, but we're actually not doing so great. Like, currently, um, we're in fifth place in the medal count. We do we normally pull out in the summer Olympics and then we just expect that to be the case in the Winter Olympics? Because I feel like we usually place first or second in the medal count in Winter Olympics too. Oh really? Yeah, we so usually. So we're just doing particular. Yeah, really so Norway is running away at the top with thir- thirty three medals, which is like a ton. Germany is second with twenty four. Mm-hmm. Canada third twenty one. Netherlands fourth sixteen, and U S fifth with sixteen. So we're kind of tied. Mm-hmm. with Netherlands, but it's just interesting how um, we're not doing as good as we normally do. Yeah. Also, like the traditional, quote-unquote traditional sports, like bobsled, cross-country, alpine skiing, figure skating, like the Americans aren't doing so hot in Didn't this year. we just get our first women's cross-country we medal did. gold, yes. though? We did, yes. That was cool. That was cool. We got a gold, which was awesome. Um, but that's the only medal we've gotten from cross country right. skiing. Alpine skiing, like we haven't done as good. Ted Ligeti hasn't gotten any medals. Ooh, and he's then, a big name, isn't he? Yeah. And Michaela Schifrin and Lindsay Vaughn only have one medal apiece between them and yeah. they were like supposed to be big stars going into this. So So we um So we're not doing so hot. But we're doing good. Oh, also the U.S. figure skating team is not doing No, they're very not good. doing hot. We well, got, the ships got a... What's yes, it? so we got a bronze in the team event, and we got bronze in ice dancing with the ships, right. which was awesome. They deserved it. Speaking of ice dancing, really oh, quickly, yes. my Twitter feed has been completely full of uh, mentions of the, uh, of the Canadian ice dancing team. Moyer and Virtue, Scott Moyer and Tessa Virtue, yes. right? And like how they pulled out, and I didn't even watch the event, but from what I understand, they pulled out this amazing program, and now everybody yeah. is shipping them, which means they want them to be actually dating because it was so romantic or something so evocative of that kind of emotion. And they claim that they're not in a relationship, but they, when you watch them, it's like, how can you not, not be? be? Like, well, I was reading an article today because my friend is like one of my best friends is really, really into them, and she, so I found this article from Time, I think, where he had given an interview and just said, "We've been married. We've been in a relationship with our sport, and if we retire, then maybe that'll give us some time to like explore." I mean, our they have been skating together been, for twenty years. Yeah, it's so, been a really long time. Because like, didn't they? I saw a video of them when they were really young skating mm-hmm. together. So anyway, that so the entire world is. Shipping. Right. The wire and virtue. So, and then a little quick spotlight on the rest of the American figure skating. Like, our men didn't do very good. Nathan Chen had high expectations and Although he literally an fell from grace. Long program. He did. He did. He, he, land, he was the first to land five clean quads, and he actually had mm-hmm. six in his, his free skate. Yeah. And it's interesting if figure skating did their scoring like other sports did, where it's like the qualification. Or the final score doesn't build on the qualification round score. Yeah. Then he would have won because he had the highest free skate program. But yep. since figure skating is an aggregate score and it yeah. builds upon it, he was just so far behind. But he did come back from seventeenth place to was it fifth, fifth? place? Fifth. Yeah, 
So, I mean, you have to give him some credit there, but I mean... I was on the phone with my dad when he landed his sixth quad. <laughs> my dad was like, wow. But I mean, people were... Ex- he was a gold medal, medal contender coming yeah. into oh, this. Oh, yeah. He was, he was set to displace the guy who actually... The Japanese guy who actually did win the... Um, the medal, the Yes, gold. and that Japanese, Hanyu is his last name. He's really he's good. The best. So. Hmm. Uh, yeah, okay. What so, can you do? So it's interesting, but. If we seem distracted, it's because we're watching Ladies Bigger in the background. Yeah. It's probably fine. Um, the U.S. just won a silver medal. Which, sadly, we didn't get the gold, but at least we got a medal. Mm -hmm. Um, But speaking of snowboarding, the, like, newer extreme sports the U.S. is doing really good at. Five of our six gold medals have been from snowboarding. Really? And, like, our snowboarding team is doing really good, like, freestyle. Skiing is doing pretty good. So, like, we're doing good at those events. So it's kind of interesting how that's all working out. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say? Also, if you haven't seen, like, an interview of Adam Rippon, go watch it. Cause you need to. He's hilarious. He's so funny. And I, like, He's the when it, first openly gay figure skater to skate for the United States in an Olympics. We've had, I mean, some that were probably not straight. Like, um... Johnny Weir? Johnny Weir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he's the first one who's openly gay. And, like... For example, one time he was like, for my excitement level, I'm about at a Meryl Streep. And it was just like, what? He, I don't know what that means. He just means, but says cool. the funniest things. He's funny. And like, He's also an official NBC commentator now. Actually, he turned that down. Did he turn it down? Yeah, so like, interesting, NBC offered him the position to like, be a commentator and really? report for the rest of the games, because his event was over. Yeah. But he turned it down because that means he would have had to have left the Olympic Village and couldn't stay with the athletes anymore. Oh. So he said he wanted to concentrate and, like, cheer on his teammates and gotcha. stay with the athletes. He did comment on one of the, like, figure skating with Leslie Jones, and that oh. was a delightful interview to if watch. If you haven't seen Leslie Jones' oh. Olympics commentary on her Twitter feed, you should. She's, like, the biggest Olympics fan that's out there, and it's hilarious. Yeah, and so NBC, she was doing so... So much during Rio that NBC sent her down there halfway through the games. It did. And then they just made her an official commentator for these games. It's fr- really kind of fun to watch. Okay, um, next. So, this is tied to the Olympics. So, Russia in this Olympics is competing, as we know, as the Olympic Athletes from Russia. Right. Or the OAR. Well, apparently, there's... I didn't know this, but there's a band called OAR... Oh, for real? Yeah. I, you've probably... I don't know. They were, like, early 2000s. They had, like, one or two hits. But apparently, due to, like, OAR being used in the Olympics, their, like, streaming on Spotify has spiked. And, like, their <laughs> Google searches for this band has, like, spiked. And I'll, they're getting, like, all this free press because of the Olympics. And I read this uh, one interview and the band leader was like, yeah, this is nice. Like, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> but That's um funny. they you might know their most famous song is called Shattered. It's like turn the car around. Da, 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 uh-uh, da. I don't know. Do you know that song? Mhm. I think so. You'd probably recognize it. I play it. Give us a hum. You want me to play it? I Yeah. Does this sound familiar? No. I want to hear No, I... Let me get to the chorus. This isn't familiar at all. Does that not sound familiar? No. Okay, right here. This is the part. If you'll know, it'll be right here. No? No. I don't know that at all. Okay, well. All right, well, that's disappointing. So they've gotten a lot of free press from the Olympics. It's kind of funny, funny. like how random things like that just pop up out of what's going on. So congrats to that band. In other Russia Olympics news. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there was a Russian athlete who was cleared, obviously, to be able to compete in these Olympics. He was found, uh, his 
his samples were found to be doped, so he was found doping. Uh, he's a Russian curler, like, I don't, I don't know why you need yeah, to why? dope <laughs> if you're curling. Uh, but he, they retested his second sample, and it also confirmed a doping result. So they haven't done, as far as I can tell, they haven't done anything about, they haven't done anything yet with that, but he's currently accused of doping at the Olympics where he had to be specifically cleared of not doping before he could even compete in them. So that's exciting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens if they... If they ban him, if they punish him at all, you know. Yeah. If he gets... I don't know what they'll do. Yeah. So... You're right. It'll be it's fascinating. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so the next thing uh, I did not watch, and I did not put myself through the torture of... Even <laughs> I did, I heard and it all was... sorts of stuff about it. So, Fergie sang the national anthem at a sporting event. <sighs> yes, it was at the NBA All-Star Game, which was held this past weekend in Los Angeles. And... It, it, I don't even know, like, what to say about this. You just need to go and watch the video <laughs> yourself. I want to do that, though. Link, link to so, it in the don't, description. Like, what she tried to do is she tried to do, like, a bluesy, like, stripped-down version. Oh, no. And, okay, full disclosure, like, the national anthem of the United States is, like, a really hard song to sing. Like, it's yeah. not just your drop-in-the-bucket, like, average sing-in-the-park song. Like, no, it's it, it's, it has a big range, and it has, yeah. like... A lot of nuance to it and it, it 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 just is all over the place so like full disclosure like we'll give it to Fergie like yes it is a hard song to sing like and she's not the first person to flub it like clearly like there have been plenty of like documented instances when people have like bombed the national anthem right yeah. but this one was just oh it, <laughs> It was really bad. Like, oh, good. It was bluesy, Excellent. and she tried to, like, slur the words and be all like, Arr, and, like... No! And Ugh. Twitter was not having it. No. Like, the internet went after her hard. And it's like... Uh, sadly, like, that's what happens <laughs> in our world of social media and, like, interconnectedness on yeah. the internet. It's like, you get attacked really quick and really fast and really sharp if you... um do something that people don't like yeah. so she was attacked on social media really bad and so yeah i i can't really explain how she's saying it. you just have to go and watch oh, the video I guess it's, we'll have to link to it. it's just that bad it really is it's just that bad and so you know props to fergie for like trying to sing it also side note like fergie has been like just like she's been underground like in the like cultural world like yeah. she hasn't done much until now she kind of resurfaced so hopefully she wasn't like trying to like rebound her career off this because <laughs> it didn't work off this appearance because it didn't funny. work so i can see her going on like jimmy fallon though and like joking about it and yeah. like trying to regain the ground so we'll see right so that was interesting. Okay, next quick thing before we move on to our main pop culture discussion, but this is movie related. They Universal Pictures announced that they're making a Jurassic World three, which will come out in June twenty twenty one. They haven't even released. Um... I know the second one is going to release this summer, and then the third one in twenty twenty one. Which like the previews look okay for it, but I'm not into that kind of thing. So I, I want to go see and it. And I'm so not. I, I'm, I've soaked about this before. I'm so not into remakes and sequels. This is well, like... And these are like... Th this is like remakes. remakes. <laughs> sequels of remakes. Yeah. It's like... Yeah, no. We we don't need this. Yeah. Like, we do not need this. Like, yes, Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard are great actors. No doubt. Like, they'd be... But they have other projects that they're just wonderful in. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's Sadly, not though, necessary. Sadly, though, Jurassic World made a bucket of money so like universal pictures is probably like there's nothing to deter them from keeping on making these because it yeah. it was so good it made so much money. right so all right so moving do? on from that to an original story Ugh. i mean it's original in that i mean it's original but it also takes place within a universe Stu and emily saw black panther last night i saw it last thursday and uh we're gonna try to be spoiler free but mm. not really so if you haven't seen it or you are planning on seeing it and don't want it ruined for you maybe skip the next hmm, 10 minutes <laughs> we'll see uh the next five to eight minutes maybe 10 check back in okay so 
first impressions? I I just loved it. Like, the whole movie, I was 100% glued in. Like, I was... They had me the whole time. Like, yeah. I was dialed in, like, nothing else. Like, I was not... Like, sometimes you go to movies, you're like, oh, I'm kind of hungry. Or like, oh, like, my ear itches. Yeah. And you're, like, kind of distracted. Or like, oh, there's a weird noise in the background. Like, the... You can tell when you've been sitting for too long. Yeah. Or like, oh, I can hear the air conditioning coming on. Like, no, yeah. none of that. Yeah. I was, like, completely 100% yeah. glued into the movie. Like, it totally had my attention. Nothing else was distracted me. And yeah. I, from start to finish, it was great. And even, like, today, the day after, I'm still like, wow, that yeah. was a really great film. So I went with three of my best girlfriends up here, and um, we, uh, all of us are kind of, like, are definitely progressive in our political views, and then also very, fe- like, just very much uh, worried about people who are represented, how people are represented of different ethnicities and genders and and uh, orientations and whatever else is is happening and so for us it was just like this powerful like we went and saw it in the night mm-hmm. we saw angela davis who is this uh black activist who was part of the black panthers uh in uh in the 60s 50s and 60s and so we we just had this huge night where it just was like this powerful punch where the themes and the characters and the richness of the history that's pulled in they just um <laughs> they're just so uh it's just so powerful because it, it portrays it portrays an Africa that we don't get to see or that doesn't fit our normal perception of it and the story was so good and they had to confront these different narratives and it confronted us with these different narratives especially as white people uh that you just were challenged and engaged at every point and i have been listening to the soundtrack nonstop as i do after i go see a movie (laughs) um like it is just so 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 good and i think i agree with you like the fact that it was um so representative like if you were someone of African heritage like this would totally just like make you feel right. so awesome and like there were only two white people in the <laughs> one of them movie. was the bad guy and one of them was the bad guy and he one of the bad guys yeah. You know. yeah so and they had very 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 well they had pretty minor roles Everett yeah. Ross was he wasn't like super minor but Is he like flaw? No, Everett yes. Ross is the CIA agent. Oh, Martin okay. Freeman. You're the name of the I'm character. I'm talking about the character, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, also, right. side note, a lot of people pointed out that the two white people were Andy Serkis and Martin Freeman, who have both appeared in a different franchise together in Lord of the Rings as um, Gollum and Bilbo. Oh, you're so, so right. everyone is like, it's Gollum and Bilbo <laughs> <laughs> in That's Black funny. Panther. The thing I loved, though, was not just that, like, there weren't, there were only two white people, but that the the warriors that surround the king aren't men yeah they're women so the general is a woman and she's the one she was um, pretty Nicole, no not it's nakia is his girlfriend i liked nakia nakia is really cool okay I really we liked gotta like nakia. organize this a little bit i'm talking <laughs> about the general okoy is that her name oh what's her i name? can't remember her name right now but she is so cool like she first is. of all the queen's guard all shave their heads okay so you would think like a lot of times we think of of bald heads as not feminine but the Mm. queen's guards are so uh they are so feminine and yet so much the warrior that you do not mess with them Mm -mm. you do not mess with them at all and you know that like there's one point where she's forced to put on a wig for them to go (laughs) undercover and like like she is so uncomfortable and it is so funny and the wig becomes like this part of her defense because she just wants it off of her head when they get into the fight scene but she is just i loved the fact that, that the king relied so heavily on her as a confidant mm. and as her as his general as his like basically his uh uh second sec- in command. secretary of defense basically yeah. yeah his second in command the guy the woman he turned to when he needed to make a military decision was just like i loved that can we talk about nakia for a yes, second yes we can i really liked her character and uh-huh. and it wasn't like it was interesting because she was the love interest but that like wasn't her only no 
her only purpose in the plot. Right. Which is interesting, and it's like, probably is a very calculated move on the part of the filmmakers, because usually the love interest, like, is just there as the love interest. Right. But she was a spy. Like, she's, she's spy been out. And an incredible warrior on her mm-hmm. in her own right. Like, when they pick her up, she's, like, undercover in this trafficking ring trying mm-hmm. to rescue these women. And, like, the reason, we kind of understand that the reason why they broke up in the first place, T'Challa and Nakia, is that, um, is that she didn't feel like she could do much good inside of Wakanda. Mm. And she needed to be outside in the... I saw a really interesting tweet, um, and it said that Nakia, so Lupita... Lupita Nyong'o. Yeah, I can't say her name. She also plays Moss Kanata. Yeah, she's been in a lot of stuff. She's a great actress. Yeah. Her, her. um, Michael B. Jordan's character. Yeah. And Sterling K. Brown's characters, which, side note, I didn't even know Sterling K. Brown was in this. Like, did I they, know. Did they keep that a secret? I don't know how they managed Because I feel that. like there was so big. much hype around all the other actors. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, Sterling K. Brown is in this too. And That's he's like, really big right now. I know. And I was looking at him going, he looks so familiar. Why can't I place him? Oh, my friend leaned over and he's, I was like, he's like, he's in This Is Us. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, yes, I love him. He's just in a different circumstance. But... Those three characters, so Lupita's, um, Michael B. Jordan's, and Sterling K. Brown's characters were all characters who were native Wakandans but had spent a lot of time outside of Wakanda. Right. Well, and, and they Michael all... B. Jordan's character had never been well, to Wakanda. Correct. Yeah. So they all wanted to help the outside world with Wakanda's resources. Yeah. They just had different ideas of how, how to, to go, go about that. It. Right. And I was Which like, wow, that's such a cool, like... Yeah. They all kind of have the same purpose, but just different um, means. Right. Which was an interesting analysis. That was cool. Okay, we have to talk about Shuri, though. Oh, I loved her. So Shuri is arguably, like, for some people, Shuri is the, like, the hero. Like, Black Panther aside, Shuri is the most important character in this movie because Shuri is T'Challa's younger sister. So she's the princess. Technically, she's a Disney princess. She's the princess of Wakanda. And she is basically the engineering brain behind a lot of their new technological developments. Like, she is this incredible scientist who is always working and also manages to be a goofball in the process and still want to do a bunch of things. Like, there's this huge ceremony that they do at the beginning of the film, and she, like, messes with this really uber-serious moment because she's wearing this, like, this, uh native dress and she (laughs) has a corset as a part of it and so she just wants out of the corset so she just wants to be done uh but it's just she's just hilarious but also super smart so the one of the articles that i was reading points out that shuri shuri uh is this in canon canonized character now she's a woman she's a woman of color and she's a scientist and, and a warrior. Like, all of these things. Like, she's such an important character for women of color and girls of color to see themselves um, in this True. role as an incredible scientist who is better at her job than uh, any of the men who are around her. So, I just, I love her character. Um, any other characters we want to dissect? Um... I mean, we could do them all. I know but... we could. <laughs> the other thing that's really I really loved about this was the incorporation of actual African tribal like dressing and hairstyles. Mm-hmm. So I was reading some articles um, from like the woman who did like the dre- the wardrobe and the woman who did hair, and she said that there wasn't a diffuser in sight on. What the hairdresser said there wasn't a diffuser insight on the set because they wanted women and, and the men to show off their natural hair. Oh. And so they, they did a lot of work for that. So they didn't make it look like, I mean, they, they made it look as, as natural as possible and as, as true to themselves as possible. And Shuri's hair in particular is my favorite thing. Like just watching the evolutions of her hairdos and hairstyles. Mm. And, and also uh, the Queen Mother's locks are so cool i yeah i it's, didn't you don't see them until like yeah two-thirds away through the movie and you're yeah. like whoa, whoa she's got hair she's got hair and it's these long lovely uh you would call them dreadlocks but they are there's a new movement in the african-american community to get away from the word dread because they're not dreadful oh. they're just locks 
So they're yeah. they're like dreadlocks. They're locks. Um, they and and they're just gray. Like they're shocking because she's had an up in this traditional African headdress Which for looks the rest really of the cool. movie. Yeah, it's it's a, supposed to be a ceremonial headdress from mm. what I was reading. It's really cool. Yeah, I didn't when she didn't have her hat or her headpiece on for the first time. I was like, whoa, whoa, yeah, where'd you come <laughs> from? And then you see her in actual pictures and she doesn't have gray hair. And then you're like, okay, now I have to acclimate myself to this <laughs> to the actress. Versus the queen mother. So that's, it's really beautiful to see all of, and the tribes all have different, like, characteristics distinct, of distinct yeah. African traditions. So it's really cool. Um, I think I'll, I'll probably connect to at least the, uh, there's a Twitter thread that goes through mm. all of the, it's a, they've made it into a moment now that goes through all of the African traditions that are drawn upon for that thing. Anyway, it's a really cool movie. It's definitely worth it to, like, get outside of your comfort zone and kind of explore. And these aren't even, this isn't even a real culture, but to kind of be exposed to that. Yeah. And also, it's really important to, um, as Deb Denson said, she's a professor at USU. She said, like, she she's very much about uh, representation in comics. And she talks about how, like, we have to vote with our money. So we have to show that, like, these kinds of movies that have uh, characters and heroes that are not the what we're normal, the normal male heterosexual um, white American heroes that we're used to seeing in film. When we have these films, we need to vote with our money and show the film industry that we really do want these movies to be around. Um, Black Panther actually had it. It had the highest, um, highest single superhero opening weekend of any movie. It's only outpaced by The Force Awakens. <laughs> So yeah, it's made a ton. It's made a ton of money. Keep voting with your money is basically what the moral of the story there is. It's it's really an incredible movie and like worth seeing at least once. It's made it onto my list of the top movies of the year, which isn't like terribly difficult to do, but like <laughs> I've said that about a lot of movies recently. Like The Last Jedi was super good and so was The Post, but like The mm. Black Panther, I mean it's almost above the post for me in that saying. So I'm still a little bit below last Jedi, but like, you know, and then we have solo coming out. So I just, mm. I have a problem. I haven't um, seen last Jedi yet. Fun yeah. Fact. Well, you're not a star Wars person, <laughs> so that's acceptable, I guess. Uh, I would be shocked if you were one of my star Wars friends and hadn't seen it yet. Um, right. my dad told one of his students recently that he hadn't seen the last Jedi yet. Cause my dad, like, if he doesn't go see it with us, he doesn't. He, like, yeah. my mom isn't super into Star Wars. They, she, like, watches it with us, but um, she's not, like... It's not, like, a perfect date night for them to go see Star <laughs> Wars, right? So if he doesn't go see it with me, then... Or Carlton, then it's he's not going to go see it. And Carlton and I went and saw it together. Anyway, so he was, like, talking with one of his students. He teaches junior high ninth graders. And he, like, had said something about not seeing Last Jedi yet. And she just looks, he said that she looked so wounded. Like it was, she was so hurt that he hadn't seen it yet. Was so shocked. I was like, okay, dad. Um, way to wig out the ninth graders. He's got to, he's got to see it to stay, to stay hip and cool with that. <laughs> yeah, well, he'll see it eventually. Right. So he usually waits until I break down and buy the digital copy and then watches my <laughs> digital copy. There you go. So. Uh, yeah. Okay, moving on from my super geekiness and Stu's super geekiness just now, mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna move to the politics section, which is just a little bit more somber, um, a lot more somber, actually, because, um, the first thing on our list is the follow-up to, um, last Wednesday's, uh, mass shooting in Parkland, Florida. And so this weekend, it was, it's actually incredible. So a lot of these students are, these students range in age from 14 to 18. I think I mentioned that last week, but, um, who are survivors of this shooting and they have pulled together this huge movement. It's been incredible to watch them, uh, kind of, I mean, they're still dealing with the horrible effects of this, that like, this is, uh, causes PTSD, this causes depression, this mm. causes so much mental stress on you, plus you're burying your friends and your teachers. But what they've done, and a couple of them have done, is they're speaking out. They're speaking at rallies this weekend. They're organizing um, to march yeah. on Washington in what they're calling the March on Our Lives. Uh, they've been active in lobbying their state congress to mm. try and get some what things passed so that this never happens again in their state. They've been really vocal 
and uh, one of the really the the things that I learned, and I don't remember if I mentioned this last week, but um, in Florida, you can't buy a handgun until you're 21, but you can buy an AR-15, which is an assault rifle, which was used in the shooting um, in Florida. You can buy that when you're 18, and you don't need to go through. There's no waiting period. There's no there's a, there's like a light background check, but nothing, not really much more. So that's how this kid who was 19 got his hands on an assault rifle to carry out this shooting. So there was a bill in the Florida house yesterday, I think it was the house yesterday, that they were, that would have, uh, I can't remember if it banned assault rifles or if it like, it increased the age or whatever it did. Whatever it did, um, when there were Parkland students in the gallery, about a couple dozen of them, I think it was like two dozen of them, that were in the gallery when the house went to put this to a procedural vote which means that they were voting to put it on the floor for debate and actually vote to make it a law right so like it hadn't even made it to the point where they are voting on whether or not it should be a law this was a we need to talk about this vote and it got voted down by the republican majority by a wide margin so it didn't even make it to the floor for debate Mm -hmm. and so you have these heartbreaking pictures of these teenagers who just witnessed their friends and teachers being gunned down by the type of gun that this bill would have banned and uh and they're having to watch as the congress is doing nothing about it and an hour later they were passing a law uh about something else that was like not as critical as this gun measure and what these so this is heartbreaking first of all but what these kids are doing now and they're doing something that we've never seen in the wake of a mass shooting uh they are mobilizing and they are calling, and a lot of them are from Florida, right? Where the, it's very Republican, it's very much NRA, ha- like gun happy. And a lot of these kids are saying, like, I was looking forward to having my own gun and my own, uh, my own ability to to shoot this gun and whatever. But I'm not even going to do that now. Like this is just too traumatic for me. That like my views have been tr- drastically changed. And a lot of them are pushing for not laws that like restrict gun ownership but laws that are um that are making it safer for so that the background checks are a little bit more uh strict and the the ages for buying certain types of guns are restricted as as well and also why do we need why do we need to have average citizens have um like assault rifles and weapons that only and military grade weapons like that shouldn't be necessary um, so they, they're doing some incredible things that I, if I had gone through that and I was 15, 16, 17, I don't think I would have been strong enough to do that. Um, and they mm-hmm. are organizing what they're calling a March for Our Lives on Daf- Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, uh, in, on March 24th. And that should be, I mean, it's, it's really quite amazing what they're doing. Um, but Trump has also been taking some steps this week. Or looking like he's taking some steps. Yeah, today at the White House there was a what they called a listening session. Yeah. Um, so they invited people that are affected from the Parkland shooting and also from Sandy Hook and Columbine, um, which were two of the other. Sandy Hook and Columbine are like two really notable. Yeah. Mass shootings at schools. Right. Um, Columbine was like in the early two thousand. It's Late been 90s. long enough now. Yeah, it's been long enough now that like the victims of this remember. of Columbine are now in state congresses. So like there's oh. there's a guy in Colorado who was like he was in Columbine and he's now lobbying for teachers to have guns in their classrooms, which is mm. probably one of the stupidest things you could do. But whatever. Yeah, there have been a, so there have been a lot of proposals come up, and that's one of them. But yeah, anyway. So today there was a listening session at the White House. Uh, President Trump, the Vice President Pence. The vice president, Pence. <laughs> nice. vice president Pence, um, secretary of education Betsy DeVos were all there. Um, and basically, these people, from what I saw, and I need to go back because it only happened a few hours ago, so I didn't really get to review all the coverage. But they're basically just pleading with the president to do something, like yeah. saying, "You have the power. You have the opportunity to change something. So, do, do something. something." Right. Columbine was in nineteen ninety nine. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, if anything, comes out of the White House from this. Um, as we know, after the Las Vegas shooting and other shootings, they the line is always, now's not the time to talk about policy. Right. 
That's always their line. Um, but we now they're... We shouldn't be politicizing this. Actually, the other thing about the Parkland students is that they've been called actors. Yeah. Which is just like the conspiracy theories driving it, us. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so continue. Sorry, I totally interrupted you. Um, so, but now there's been there's a lot of pressure to actually to do something this right. time. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the White House. Yeah, I find it interesting, policies. though, because I feel like we had a lot of pressure after Las Vegas to ban the bump stocks, and that still hasn't happened. I know, but that just kind of disappeared into thin air. I mean, even the yeah. NRA supported that, which was, like, unheard of. But speaking of that, Trump now has directed the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, to propose regulations to ban bump stocks. Yeah, I mean, okay. So the- it's like they haven't banned it. He's, like, directed him... To draw yeah. up the plan. So it's like... But the thing is, okay. is that this was already yeah. underway. Like, they were already doing this. Yeah. So Trump just looks like he's doing something more when really he's doing the bare minimum there. So it'll be interesting to see if we actually get stuff done. Uh, it's it's really hard. I think we talked about it last week with the NRA as a massive lobby that just has a chokehold on so many people. And so many, uh, so many people in the Congress. So let me clarify that. Uh, that it's just, it's going to be really difficult to see um, w- if we get anything done. Although a lot of public opinion polls are supporting stricter gun laws or stricter gun uh, or, or gun restrictions that that are are much stricter. Like polls are coming out uh, abnormally high after this event, which. It, even for after, from what I understand, it's even after a mass shooting that these are these are specifically high even after a mass shooting. But it's hard because this is obviously the 18th mass shooting since the beginning of this year of 2018. So it's just it feels like we're escalating uh, in a way that not a lot of other places are. So, All right. so we'll see what what happens on yeah. the gun control side of things because there definitely seems to be more momentum and than normal i mean there always is after school shooting but this time it feels it feels different it's different it feels different and it is different so we'll see if that gets us anymore okay the next thing moving on from this is that while uh pence was in north korea last week for the beginning of the uh, the games the olympic games uh he was supposed to meet with kim yo jong who is uh kim uh jong un's sister who was the like the high the representative from north korea there right so they were supposed to have the secret meeting uh after the the opening ceremonies and uh at the last second north korea pulled out and from what I was listening to a broadcast earlier today, this they pulled this meeting was supposed to take place the same day that Moon Jae-in was invited to visit North Korea by Kim Jong-un and uh, a lot of other things. But it's just a little bit like, like, oh, really? We could have had a talk, like Pence and, like, we could have had a U.S.-North Korea talk face-to-face and North Korea pulled out. Like, that's a bummer. Yeah. And it, it makes sense now. I mean, this is interesting because there was talk, were they going to meet, were they going to Eric, because they were so close to each other. I mean, they were they did talk. Feet, in, yeah. feet away from each other and didn't talk. So, right. you know, kudos. I'm, I'm kind of a little surprised that Pence was even willing to meet with her and meet uh, with the North Korean officials because he wants to, you know, portray this strong man. Hard, like, yeah. Well, I bet that's why it was secret, right? Yeah. And it's just coming out now. Both leaders left the, left the country. Yeah. last week but so Pence is I mean, back here doing whatever he's doing so doing whatever the vice president he was does. giving a speech today and i can't remember where it was so oh it was the there was a meeting of the national space council that's what it was which is the whole thing yeah also donald trump is in india giving a foreign policy donald speech. trump jr jr sorry yeah jr is in india giving a foreign policy speech and everyone's like what I got, I don't, you're not the Secretary of State. You're not the Secretary of State. Technically, you're not supposed to be associated with the administration at all because you're running the Trump company. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so much sketch going on right now. That's beside the point. Okay. Uh, next thing is... I'll stoop. What is the next thing? Oh. So, there have been more developments in the Russia investigation. Okay. So, last week we talked about the 13 indictments. Right. 
um, f- that happened Friday night afternoon yeah. right before we recorded. That was big. Yep. That was huge, and that was like a signal. It reminds. That... Go ahead. It well, it's a reminder that Mueller isn't just looking at the com- the tie between Trump and Russia, but that he's looking at Russian interference writ just large the whole thing. in the election. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of like a a shot across the bow, or like. Yeah. They probably won't, like, get to prosecute any of those people, because they're no. mostly all in Russia, but it was just a signal, like, we know what's going on, we've investigated, here's some proof, yeah. and we're serious. Right. Um, but there was another indictment um, and a guilty plea that happened this week. So, it's a Russian lawyer by the name of Alex Vandersvon? <laughs> Good guess. Maybe? Good enough. He is the son-in-law of a Russian oligarch who's apparently named in the controversial Trump dossier. Hmm. And he pleaded guilty this week to lying to investigators in Mueller's probe. Um, and it's not... This article says it's not clear at what extent he may be helping Mueller. Um, but he's the fourth person to plead guilty in the Russian probe. Um, and he admitted in federal court to the sole count of making false statements about his communications with former Trump campaign aide Rick Gates, who is Paul Manafort's, like, right-hand man yeah. and has already been indicted. Right. So, yeah, we've, already, we've got another indictment. So, there's been... What's interesting about, like, this Russia Mueller probe and Russia probe is a lot of them have lied to, like, the FBI I know, I know, and federal that's investigators. What, like, it's ridiculous. What I don't know, like, <laughs> why do you feel like, like the thing that I don't get is that if you've done nothing wrong, right? Like even if you like done, if you feel like, like you're innocent, yeah. What's if you feel like you're innocent and you feel like you've done nothing wrong, like why would you lie to the FBI when you know that that's a felony? Like that in and of yeah. itself, maybe is they a didn't felony. know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I certainly didn't know, but, I, I mean, I haven't really stupid. been around the block as much as they have, but right. I think everybody now knows, like, don't lie to the FBI under any circumstances, because <laughs> any circumstances. isn't the law, even if they're, like, not under oath or anything, like, if you just lie to them just, you know, in in any capacity, in any circumstance, yeah. that's, a, that's a crime, is if I understand it correctly. I think that's right. Um, I think that I'm not sure exactly yeah, I the, think that's right. The law. There. You have to be careful what you say to the FBI. I think that's. I think you're right there. So anyway, that's no news there. We can't keep track of the, everything here. It's crazy you now. Like it's just so much. All what I want to listen to, and if you want to know more about the Russian investigation, the NPR poli- uh, or podcast Embedded. Embedded. They um, did a. They've really gone yeah. in depth and like done the whole timeline they came out with like two huge episodes that like detail everything before the election and since the election yeah the host of that and i can't remember her name right now Kelly mccavers yes i was gonna say kaylee mcenany and that's not oh. her she's a, a very conservative commentator uh no so kelly mccavers was on npr and she was like this is for my own sake like I could not keep track of everything, so I went in and put everything in line, and then made it for you too. So it was good. So if you want like a good, um, like timeline and information on the Russia probe and everything that's happened, go listen to that. Yeah. Okay. So next things next. The, a lot of the talk about immigration, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later too. But a lot of of Trump's problem with immigration has to do with uh, something he's calling chain migration, which actually isn't like the best term for it. Chain migration or uh, family migration is basically when like a person comes over and in the process uh, of doing that because they're there and they have like they they have the ability to bring over their immediate family so their parents not siblings their spouse and kids like that's who they have the ability to also like sponsor it still takes uh, family members like that quite a bit of time to go through the process of, of getting. A green card and being able easy. to immigrate. It's not easy. It's still like seven to eight years sometimes for people to get that kind of, of immigration. But Trump feels very strongly that we need to go to a merit-based system rather than a family-based system. The point of the family-based system is that we're keeping families together, and that's our goal. So it's really funny that like Republicans who champion the family most often in the family unit are uh, the ones breaking up families because they want to do away with teen migration. So, uh, but... 
So you have to know that in order to understand this next story. So it came out this week, and I think you know the story better than I do. Yes, the Washington Post reported this. So there have been a lot of question on the immigration status of Melania Trump's parents, um, because they are from Slovenia. Um, and clearly they, they're here in the United States, so they had to immigrate somehow, and like... Yeah. So it wasn't clear what their immigration status was, and the White House has been very mum about this. Yeah. Like, ask, they will not confirm, they will not comment on the status, the immigration status of her parents. So, which could, like, if they came from chain migration, it would look really bad for the yeah. administration. Yeah, there, right? there are rumors that they So, came. the yeah. Washington Post reported just the other day, what's today? Today's the 21st. Oh, so it was today. This came out today that her parents are legal, have become legal permanent residents and are close to obtaining their citizenship. Um, but their attorney declined to say how or when the couple gained their green cards. So this just raises way more questions about, did they come from this quote unquote chain migration? How did they get here? According to this article, it says immigration experts say that they very likely relied on a family reunification process known as chain migration. Right. The other thing I think that somebody's pointed out that like back way back in Trump's line his family also benefited from chain migration like his grand grandfather I think so I don't know he wants to end this yeah. process that brought a lot of people over that he cares about so I don't get it but whatever so that would be very interesting if we find out that they were actually benefited from chain migration from that family unification effort okay last thing before we move on to our soapbox uh we talked about on Friday that Romney had announced his run for the Utah Senate, or for, sorry, for Utah Senator, uh, replacing Orrin Hatch. Over the weekend, Trump uh, endorsed him via Twitter, and Romney accepted that endorsement, and all of us were disappointed. <laughs> well, because you kind of, I mean, like, one of the things that's exciting about a Romney versus an Orrin Hatch is that uh, in the past, Romney has stood up to Trump, and Hatch has just kind of been, like, Trump's right-hand man. He's been... been not quite as right-hand man as David as Devin Nunes, but... He's been a very big suck-up, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That's, he, uh, like, putting it mildly. Once called uh, Trump the greatest president ever? Which was, everyone was like, what? <laughs> like, have you never heard of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or FDR or... Yeah, anyway, it's fine. Also, funny story. So, over the weekend, we saw, like, because uh, it was President's Day, there were, like, the rankings of worst, best and worst presidents. And for the first time in years, James Buchanan was bumped from his bottom spot to be replaced with Donald Trump. <laughs> so... It was very exciting. <laughs> All right, moving on to our soapbox. This is a soapbox we've wanted to do for a while uh, because the deadline for the for Congress to pass a DACA Act before Trump technically disbands the program is March 5th. So we wanted to talk really briefly about DACA and immigration. Um, DACA is the Dreamers Act, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Act, which just uh, allows children who were brought here when they were too young uh, and they were brought here illegally that they're able to pursue educations and jobs um, and, and that kind of thing. So they're also called dreamers. Uh, and so uh, do you want to start with this one? I think Emily also had some things that she had feelings about on this one. Yeah. The thing, the thing for me is, is like, so these, I don't know if you mentioned, I kind of zoned out for a second there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are people who are brought to the country illegally by right. their parents when they're children. Right. So the main like narrative around these people is they didn't choose themselves to come here. So, but this is the only home they've ever known. But yes, a lot of them, most of them have grown up here. They know English. They don't really know the native language of their country of their parents origin. And so it's like they view America as their home. Right. And so a lot of people, and I think it, it's valid, it's like, why should we punish these kids for the quote-unquote crime that their parents committed by bringing right. them here illegally? Right. And 
I think in all of the immigration debate, everything, these, this group of people are the hardest hit. Like they're in the trickiest spot because like you said, they view America as their home. And if you were to quote, you know, deport them to their quote unquote origin country, Mm -hmm. most of them, they don't, don't know the language and they wouldn't like, they don't know how to survive in that culture. Like they are Americans by every sense of the word. They live here. This is their culture. I mean, so it'd be really hard for them to go back to that country. Right. But what's sad is everyone claims to have, like, compassion for this group and concern, but, like, nobody can come to a consensus of how best to help how them. How to help them. Right. And what I think is sad, too, is Trump claims to feel really bad for these people, and, like, he loves the dreamers, but then he, like, created his own political crisis by ending the deadline. Uh-huh. It's like, you didn't have to... Ending the program. Like, he himself was the only person that made this and now he's tweeting March things like March 5th deadline. Can't believe Congress like what what is he saying? He's saying things he's like He's blaming Congress. He's blaming the Democrats. Okay, so he's like Democrats don't want to do anything for the dreamers. Like we should help them blah blah blah. blah. And all of us who are like paying attention are like Okay, but you're the one who ended the program. You're the one who is putting these people in a tricky spot. Like why are you blaming the Democrats? They're actually the ones trying to get there to be debate yeah. about this and trying to get a bill passed. And I think the the political things. reasoning and thinking behind it was to create like a deadline so there was pressure to like to do create something. legislation. Right, because but... the the thing about this is, and it's been this way ever since Obama signed the DACA Act, uh, which was a presidential executive order. The argument is that this the immigration isn't the purview of the president; it's the purview of Congress, and so the so technically this act should never have been signed by a president. So t- t- Trump's line of logic is that he's undoing something that shouldn't have been done by the president and should have been in Congress's hands all along. But in the meantime, you have people who don't know what they're supposed to be doing because right now they are trying to finish college or they have careers or they're trying to support a family. Like there are so many things that like, like, the, and we can't, the, they're just trying to do and they, they are such in they're in limbo right now. They don't know what to do. Uh, right now there's a court order in place from a judge that uh, stays the end of the DACA program. Uh, but that's still making its way through the courts. And so they're like, People, so the court order says that they can still file and ex, like renew their their dreamer status mm. um, past the March fifth deadline, but that's still going through the court process, and we still have Congress trying to work things out. Do you have anything to add, Emily? I feel like y'all covered it pretty well. Um, I guess something that's to consider is like DACA doesn't create citizens out of the dreamers. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that in itself should make it so it's like a good compromise. Because you can see the argument of not wanting to just give kids who come here, come here illegally uh, legal status or citizenship because then what's going to stop all the parents from bringing all of their kids over here and like sacrificing their lives for their kids' sake. Right. Which is admirable in its own sense, but right. you can see like the hardship that could put on our country. So DACA really it's a great compromise where it gives these kids a chance to succeed since it wasn't their fault, but they also still have to go about finding citizenship just like anyone else. They have to figure that one out. Right. The other thing uh, that there have been several plans proposed, and one of the plans uh, gives dreamers like a 10-year window in order to get like 10 years that they have to go through to get their citizenship. So it offers them an ability to get citizenship, but those programs aren't meeting with the white approval of the Congress. In addition, uh, they the immigration overhauls proposed, especially by Trump, incorporate the dreamers into the total. So they, they count them as new immigrants, so they would count them in the, into the total of the, the number of immigrants that we allow in every year, uh, which would significantly decrease uh, the number of like refugees and stuff like that that we can bring in if we're willing to bring in refugees. So... There are a lot of plans on the table, but we haven't been able to find a consensus yet. And that's uh, supposedly one of the big things on the docket when Congress comes back in session. They're out right now. So, Okay, I think that's it, right? Anything else? I think so. I think we made it. I think we did. Thanks for listening, and 
We'll see you next week. Yep.